Welcome to another edition of the ESBC Update. I'm Mike Tarosian, your host. Uh, today with us, we have uh, designers uh, from DRA, Jim Barrett, and the Elementary School Building Committee Chairperson, uh, Joe Markey. And uh, let's see, guys, it's only been a couple weeks since uh, your meeting on February 11th, and, uh, but a bunch of stuff has been happening here. Uh, construction manager approval. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we've approved a construction manager. This is a firm that's going to work with us through design and construction. And uh, Cal Antonio is the name of the company. They're based in Holliston. Uh, they've done a number of school projects, including some with our design partner, DRA. And uh, Jim, I don't know if you want to add anything else. Sure. Um, the uh, CM selection process, uh, you know, it was just a, we had four firms ultimately that were identified as shortlist for the uh, uh, ESBC, um, certainly all just tremendously qualified, so not really a bad choice in the group, uh, but certainly uh, Col Antonio impressed the selection committee in terms of how well prepared and how well they already knew the project and the thought that had already been put into the process. So right. this is a team that um, both our team has worked with in the past, as well as our uh, owner's project manager, uh, Compass, has worked with them recently. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to another so every, great job. Everybody here. knows the way each other works, and it uh, sounds like this is going to help make a nice, smooth process here. With, that's, a, with a quality team, for that's sure. That's fantastic. And uh, the local company, they're from Holliston? That's correct. And uh, would the citizens, not to put you on the spot, would the citizens of Hopkins maybe know of any of their work around in the Metro West area? Um, maybe they, put you on, they don't mean to put you on the spot <laughs> like that. Right here within your community, um, gosh, it's the police or fire, I'm not sure what. Uh, police department? Police department. Yeah, uh, which was property. a brand new construction. And I apologize for not knowing uh, exactly, but I, I do know that they've worked right Excellent. here within the community. Oh, that's fantastic. So. All right, so, and everyone loves the police station that came in. Um, number one, a beautiful building. Number two, it also came in on budget, if not under. So, so far, so good. I like the sound of it. So, uh, so now they're on board. <laughs> They'll start uh, getting involved when? When do they? Right now. <laughs> That's the advantage uh, of this process. Um, uh, the ESBC uh, was able to get authorization to utilize a construction manager at risk delivery model as compared to a general contractor design bid build model. Right. In a design bid build model, we would be doing all the planning, all of the documentation, right out to point of bid and then general contractors would bid the work and begin thinking about the project. The difference in a CMR model, it's happening now. They're on board with us as a team member. So it's the ESBC, it's the design team, it's the contractor, the people that are actually going to put it in the ground collectively thinking about the project. So we get the benefit of, from them of thinking about phasing issues, constructability issues. Um, you know, we might have a, a design approach where they have two or three different alternatives where potentially we get a, a better quality project or we get a more efficient project, those types of things. So with, it, with this model that you're talking about, being better because less, less chances of overages, less chances of major delays, um, it, one, one of the things everyone thinks about with a contract, they think a contract that goes for a job and bids what they see, and in the back of their minds they know, oh, they missed something, and we're going to get, you know, there's a chance for extra here. You know, this isn't the case in this kind of model. Yeah, our job is to try to close those potentials, those, those risk centers as we go forward, and they're part of the team helping to close and those gaps. And that's all done before you even put a shovel on the ground. That's correct. Right. That's outstanding. Anything else on that? Yeah, no, no. We're excited to get going. Uh, we, uh, the team had a, uh, the, the DRA and Compass kind of had that initial meeting with Colin and Tony already. The extended committee met uh, the principals from the firm at our last meeting. So uh, 
we're, we're eager to get, get going. Great. Another thing that happened at the last meeting, you had a design presentation of the, the gym, the uh, cafetorium, and the media center. Uh, what's the gymnasium going to be like? Uh, what, what, what are the thoughts right now? Yeah, so uh, first, I, you know, my, we, right, we reviewed this at our last meeting. Our meetings are still open to the public. They're uh, held now in the, for space reasons mainly in the basement of Town Hall, which has enough space for but all it, of us. And, uh, that's a, one of the things everyone says, oh, you're in the basement of the Town Hall, you know? First off, the basement, it's, it's the lower level it's, it's a, a lower it's a level nice, <laughs> it's a nice part it, well because Accessible if you go back entrance. to when that used to be the senior center and it was the basement it was a basement yeah. this year it's another floor of the building it's a big space we and have a large team right we have 13 members we've got dra we've got compass we've got Colin antonio plans on the so. table you get all the paperwork and you get the room that you guys can meet yeah. and you still have room for the public right and the public's still showing up for your meetings yeah 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 at our last meeting we had a uh, a, a gentleman from town who's uh, got a family and his, one of his children is going to be entering the school. So he stopped by to learn more about uh, where we were in the process and hear about the latest thoughts on design. Yeah, and you still take the input because I believe you open your meetings with any public yeah, input. Yeah, so first agenda a topic and we'll take it as it goes through the meeting too is an invitation for community input. So we still encourage people to attend and, uh, and, uh, and give us their input. Yeah. We also still monitor the email address School project right. at hopkintinma.gov, hopkintinschoolproject.com website. So still have your Facebook. Yeah. still have everything yeah. going. So well, yeah, we were excited to see, uh, you know, the the latest thinking back from DRA on the design. Uh, we've given them some direction, and they've got a lot of experience. They're educating us as we go as well. Okay. Uh, but we feel our our biggest influence can be on things like uh, the community uh, integration into the themes that matter to the community, uh, building a site that, building a, 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 a facility that <clears throat> is uh, integrated into its surroundings. That's something that matters to Hopkinton. So sure. with that kind of direction, and uh, I guess thirdly would be to ensure that this is a school that's digestible to young kids who are going to be using it. Well, that's it. And on all they're three they're of these, the, right there. Yeah, on all three of those, the design teams have been very responsive and creative. So, uh, happy to share some of so, those yeah, thoughts so what today. Kind of, so, yeah, what's the, so what kind of things are going into the gymnasium? <laughs> so, well, far? Um, the 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 gym is one part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but certainly we've been through the entirety of the building mm -hmm. in terms of uh, thinking relative to interior layout. Uh, how it will be used ultimately by the staff, by the teachers, and as, as Joe indicated, ultimately by the children. Uh, this, is a, this is a building that has to come to serve very young users in the community. And uh, you know, our, our job is to try to break that down and make it digestible you know, for a young user sure, uh, sure. to come to understand the building, come to feel comfortable within it, and uh, come to use the building. Um, successfully, you know, in an education process. Um, so we have started with the classroom as kind of the core element, and yeah. we've worked through a series of reviews, um, both with user groups, uh, with administration and staff, and then ultimately with the SBC. And um, so we've moved from the classroom to spaces like administration or support spaces, uh, other spaces like the IMC or the library. Um, as well as uh, the cafetorium and the gymnasium. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, right now we've been through all of those spaces and we have uh, good direction on each. So we're into a kind of fine tuning, if you will, yeah. of it. So will the media center be part of the library? Is that? It, it is. It is. Yes. Okay. It's, it's the name for the library, uh, gotcha. is the media center. Um, and uh, to your initial question, you know, what will the gym be like? Well, it's a, it's a large gym. It's a uh, full-size gym. And the idea of that is um, there's, a, there's a very important purpose of during the day physical education being provided through a space sure. where we have plenty of space to run around and utilize it. Um, it'll be a wood floor surface. Uh, it'll have backstops, which you would expect in a gym. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's, it's positioned in a way within the building that, as well as serving the day in, day out use of uh, education, uh, it will serve the community at large as well. It's positioned in a way where it can easily be accessed, uh, storage and toilet core, that type of thing nearby. 
yet we're able to segregate off the remainder of the building so that we don't have cross traffic in areas where it's not intended. Right, unlike, unlike some of the other buildings that we have now where you really can't separate your gyms from other school business yeah. and you know everyone wants this you know because yes it is a school but it's also a public building and you know tap off tournaments we need yeah. those basketball courts and that's right um, you just I, I think that's a great idea laying it out so that you can keep it separate from the public and yet a school business can still happen right sure. that's great so as far as um, the, the, one of the other topics that you mentioned too was the interior finish designs. You know, so you mentioned how does it have a Hopkins feel? Does it have a feng shui feel? What, 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 what general direction are you pointing right now? Uh, well, first uh, I want to point out we've, we've got the director of facilities for the schools involved in all these discussions and that's uh, critical input, right, uh, for the design team and then uh, the administration as well. Uh, helping uh, provide their input. Uh, and the committee is then providing input around, um, hey, how do we make this uniquely Hopkinton as well? So, um, Jim, I don't know if you want to add any details on how we're approaching the design internal. Sure. Um, well, certainly um, our, our, our team comes to the table um, always in the first position of listening. You know, we, we have done a lot of uh, educational facilities. We have done a lot of early childhood centers. That said, uh, every one is different. Yeah. Every one is very responsive to the community that it's serving. And the first step in that is us listening. So we learn a lot from the users. We learn a lot from administration. And we learn a lot from the ESBC and others about this community. Uh, and as Joe was indicating, um, our first tenant, you know, as we thought about the design of this building, was to have it be a building that's about the environment that it's in. Uh, so when we think about color within a building, we think about color that's reflective of what's happening in the environment around it. Um, when we're thinking about uh, pattern and, and shape within the building, we're thinking about that environment and how we can integrate it. Um, these other ideas, um, you know, what can reflect Hopkinton specifically, those are ideas coming to the table and we'll take them and absorb them and try to see if there's ways for us to integrate and make the, the overall design stronger. That's great. Now what kind of time frame before you basically say, yep, yeah, it's going to be green? You know, I mean, how, how, how close are you to that point when you, when you decide colors? I mean, I, I, of course, you're always taking the input and yeah. I'm just wondering what kind of schedule are we on for that? I yeah, can, I, yeah, it's, I can, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's underway. I, I always have to caution folks that in a uh, a, a public process, uh, we can select color. Taking it as an example, we can select material, we can select product, and certainly we do that selection process uh, within an environment, as Joe suggests, guided by people that ultimately have to care for it. Right. So head of maintenance is certainly important. It's that, outstanding. Yeah. It's it's it's, it's critical. Um, but in a in a public process, um, you know, as much as you'd like to say it's going to be uh, you know sage green number uh, PMS number thirty two X. You cannot do that. You can make that the basis of design, but it has to be able to be bid by three qualified bidders on bid day, uh, meaning three suppliers have to be able to come to the table and bid for it so that there's competition sure. uh, with the public dollar. And that's very important. So we'll have a pallet, we'll have materials as the materials as part of the basement. But as the project is bid and the subcontracts start coming in, we'll have another round of, okay, well, here's the material we got, and that green isn't <coughs> quite the green we wanted, so we gotcha. might have to shift thinking to, sure. you know, and it's another round. So it's ever-evolving. It, ever, ever it is. So That's it's probably not until you actually get to uh, 
uh, mud up the wall and put the tile in place that you know exactly what you're getting. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Comes down to the do, very do end. You wanna, yeah. Do you want to talk specifically about like the type of materials on the flooring in different parts of the building, or sure. uh, and how you know? The yeah, he mentioned already hardwood floor in the gym, so what sure. yeah. we look at how that matters to both the users and for ongoing maintenance and things like that. Right. Well, um, the wood gym, um, you know, is an example of just being responsive to the overall usage of the building. It has a wonderful warm feeling for young users, you know, when they're in there. Sure. Having a wood floor to play on, move on, it's, it's, it's a great environment. Uh, it's a sprung floor, which is an athletic floor, yep. has give to it. Uh, it's probably not noticeable to a, uh, a small child running around, but to an older, uh, you know, uh, adult uh, playing uh, Tuesday night league. Tuesday yeah. night league. Uh, <laughs> it's something that helps my knees. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> so it's a it's a great system for that. Similarly speaking, at the front entrance to the building, uh, we'll use porcelain paver tile out at the entrance point. It's hard wearing, it's durable. You don't have to wax it, you don't have to maintain right. it in that way. Right. It's a different type of maintenance schedule. Um, quarter spaces, uh, using you know rubber as a uh, material again. Um, first cost up front, slightly more expensive than something like a VCT approach, vinyl composition tile, yet in its overall life cycle, <laughs> much less expensive because sure. of the maintenance cycle. You don't have to strip it, wax it, do those things. It's basically, it's a, it's a wash and buff approach. In a, in a building like this, how, uh, how do you, or what would you figure a building like this sh should it last? I, I know we got 90 years out of a 30 year building. I mean, what could we get out of a, I mean, what, what is this figure for? Like, you have shingles that are 25 year shingles. Mm. What are you looking for the life of this building? Go ahead. We, it, yeah. we have to make a statement relative to MSBA that these yeah, sure. buildings are, you know, 30, 40, 50 year buildings. Right. Um, and that's that level of quality is what we try to kind of build into them. Um, certainly, you know, mechanical systems, they're not 50 year systems. Those are probably 20 to 30 sure. year life cycles. But that's normal mm -hmm. age maintenance that has to happen in any building going forward. Uh, we'd be proud that if in 90 years again, you know, this town was saying, gosh, we got to get rid of that new, <laughs> the, yeah, new the new elementary the school. Elementary school. <laughs> yeah, well, one, of the, one of the things we've talked about at our meetings is uh, let's make smart decisions, right? So uh, it's, if, it, if for a small dollar now, <clears throat> we can uh, get something that will save us lots of uh, operational cost over year after year after year probably a good investment. Right. But those are kind of trade-offs that we, we work through, right? Uh, but uh, for example, on the, this will be a lead uh, silver building as well. And we've talked about, you know, how do we, which of the lead features do we want to pick to add up to the points needed to qualify for lead silver? And some discussion about, you know, gosh, maybe it might make sense to look at some of the monitoring technologies which uh, might add a little cost now, but uh, with proper usage could save lots of operational sure, cost over the years. Yeah. And when you say monitoring, you're talking about your HVAC, the, the, the technology that can tell when nobody's in the room and it shuts it down and moves over other resources. Right. That's, yeah, a big cost up front, but the savings in the end, right. as long as it's maintained. Yeah. Well, it's That's very just, interesting. On that front, um, a lot of those technologies um, aren't necessarily large costs up front. Um, an example of that, uh, 10 to 15 years ago, the idea of having sensors in return air grills that would monitor CO2 levels. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody knew it was a possibility, but it wasn't happening on a regular basis. Today, it'd be unconscionable for a designer not to have that sure. uh, within a return air system. And what that means is, if you have a large gathering space like a cafetorium or like a gymnasium or like a library where it might have as few as three or four people in it on one day, but it might have a hundred people in it, um, the CO2 monitor basically knows how many humans are in that space sure, and it ramps sure. up and ramps down the HVAC yeah. system to adapt to that. 25 years ago, we just had a size for the biggest crowd that you would expect and run the system constantly awesome. at that level. So as Joe was suggesting, over time, the potential for cost savings can be dramatic. Right, and now with the technology as it is today, it's cheaper. Number two, it's always cheaper when you build it in, not add it afterwards. 
Right. You know, and that's outstanding. So speaking about technology, uh, you have technology, audio, visual, and security uh, in, in your design. What can you give us some little features that you guys are thinking about now? Or? Sure. Uh, in terms of uh, integrating thought around technology, uh, we have a consultant on board with our team that specifically that's what they live and breathe. And that's necessary as anybody sure. who deals with technology is totally cognizant of it. It's ever changing. And so it's a separate package, as a matter of fact. It's something that will not be bid until later in the project. And that's partly just trying to take advantage of that kind of constantly evolving market. Uh, knowing that we're likely going to be able to get more powerful, stronger uh, computing 18 months from now than today. Right, so the infrastructure for this technology should be in before that point. Correct. So you can still utilize it. Yep. So another, right. So it's not going to be too late to come up with this technology and say, oh boy, we should have ran that extra three wires. No, the backbone yeah. will be in place. Uh, as we build the building, the backbone will be in the plumbing, if we're, you will. <laughs> you know, I'm using plumbing as, uh, but the plumbing for this technology will be in place. Right, because just think of it, if you thought of a technology today, by the time you go to install it, now sure. you have outdated technology. Yep. So that's that's a big benefit. What kind of security features could we be looking at uh, to keep these kids safe? Sure. Well, in educational design these days, you know, uh, sadly, you know, we, we think more and more about right. the security of a building. And it, it basically falls into two categories. The first category is passive. And that idea is if a well-planned, well-designed site and building uh, is, is properly done, it can be laid out in a way where you do go have good observation of the parking areas. You do have opportunity for administration. Uh, and those who regularly would be welcoming people to the building to have good control of that front apron of the building. Sure. This building will have, for instance, a, uh, a vestibule um, a main entrance point. There'll only be, after the children are loaded into the building, there'll only be one major access to the building, like many of the sure. schools in town today. Um, you'll be buzzed in, you'll come into that vestibule. There'll be a direct connection with the office Rather than going straight forward into the building, you're taken into the office, you'll sign in at the office, you'll be identified where you can head in the building and then out into the, into the facility. You know, that's, that's very low tech, you know, that's almost passive. And then on the other side, we will have uh, security infrastructure in place, camera systems, et cetera, um, that will certainly have more backbone in place should more be needed in the future, but we'll have some deployed immediately. Great, and I know with working with the uh, police department, and school resource officer Powers, uh, they have some great plans in place, and I'm sure uh, that's all going to work out great. Yeah, this is a community-wide effort. Yeah. I mean, all these meetings so involve police, fire, right. planning. Yeah, I would like yeah. to mention we did have a meeting uh, prior to our last uh, ESBC meeting uh, with town agencies, and it was it was very helpful. You know, okay. to have that input early is really where it's best. No, that's great. Uh, delivered. Um, all right, and as we wrap it up, uh, educational planning progress. You yeah, the it's, it's uh, kind of, it's, it's constant, it's, it's throughout. So uh, in all of the design meetings, the superintendent and, and representatives from the school are involved mm -hmm. in these conversations. Uh, Jim, you can give us specifics if you like. Sure. Yeah. Yep. I, I think we touched on it a bit earlier. It's, it's basically going through all the component parts of the building space by space, space down by space. into real specific detail, you know, into the weeds of what actually happens in that space and how is it best supported. And uh, those discussions can go long, you know, because people that are uh, users, they're passionate about it. Right. They're really excited to have the opportunity to have that input. Um, and then we take those options and alternatives, we kind of revise and refine them and then we come forward and finally get, well, this is a direction that's recommended by the working group. That's then brought forward to the SBC for another round of discussion and deliberation and thought. Um, but certainly that's the, uh, the process that we've had opportunity basically to take every space in the building now through and uh, we're in, we're in good shape on that front. Is, is there anything new with the MSBA process that we need to update on? <clears throat> uh, things are going well. Uh, we, we've signed the final uh, project funding agreement 
since town meeting and town election in the fall. Uh, we've even initiated the first round of uh, reimbursements. Uh, so uh, things are good and uh, Compass Project Management has been helping keep us on track with all the requirements with MSBA. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that's outstanding. Uh, got about a minute left. Anything else we need to add? Yeah, I mean, one thing we didn't talk about as far as the site layout is uh, we talked a lot about EMC Park and the emergency egress through EMC Park. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, met with representatives from Parks and Rec and the Parks and Rec Commissioner. We did a site walk and we've identified how that access will work, right, for pedestrians to, to walk through, but to serve as emergency egress as needed by emergency, you know, uh, vehicles and whatnot. Excellent. Yeah. Outstanding. Well, gentlemen, covered a lot of stuff, and uh, you guys keep working hard at this. This is outstanding. Uh, I just want to remind everybody at home, the next elementary school building committee meeting is March 22nd, 7.30 at the lower level of town hall. Um, the public is welcome to uh, come and attend every single meeting. Uh, visit their Facebook page, visit their website, um, and come down for the meetings and uh, give some comment. They're still listening to you. So, gentlemen, thank you again for coming out. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike.